Well, well, good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Good, you hear? Just a special thanks and a shout out to uh, Jordan and Claire. They were singing in the with our choir this morning, but they also did the uh, decorations when you walked in yesterday with Jill and Allison. So if you see these people, if you know them, just say thank you for their work. And uh, maybe you'd like to get involved and help out. We'd gladly, gladly put you on the team. So I want to pick it up from last week. Uh, we're walking through the book of Matthew. And if, uh, if you guys can just shut the doors, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Walking through the book of Matthew, now we find ourselves in chapter 18. Uh, next week, we're going to kick off our Surviving Christmas series, and uh, I hope to have some skills for you to survive Christmas uh, as we go roll into Advent the week after that. So we're going to make it happen. But in this chapter, chapter 18, we could actually break it up uh, into about a half dozen life lessons. I'm not going to do that. You can thank me later for that, but it's valuable when we actually take time and we look at this entire discourse as a whole uh, and to see the sweep of it. And that's exactly what I want to do today. As a matter of fact, I'm only going to get through half of it. So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on the particulars in each section, just actually enough to really get to know what the sections uh, are saying and how they actually can be applied to us. And so the chapter is actually, it's not a code of rules of conduct or anything like that, but rather it presents principles for us to follow in the Christian life. And as I was pondering it, I thought, you know, even what we're going to look at in the second half can work anywhere, anywhere, and not just for Christians, but in anywhere. And then we'll get to that in a little bit, because what's said now in this chapter is really not that hard to understand. As a matter of fact, it's actually painfully clear. Now, what strikes you when you read this chapter is the use of family terms. Uh, the family terms for believers. They're the little ones, the children, the brothers, the sisters, the, the brethren. So in this chapter, we see Jesus using family terminology. And it immediately, immediately reminds us, as he's teaching, is that there's duties that we have to one another. Now, what also stands out in this chapter when you begin to take the time and you just begin to read through it is the seriousness of what Jesus taught and the descriptions of the punishment for those who persistently refuse and rebel and underscore the seriousness of everything that Jesus is trying to, to teach here. So I, I want to encourage you on your own time, go out and begin to read this chapter as one whole part. I said that today is all about the kids. Matthew 18 opens, at the time the disciples came to Jesus, they asked, who is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? Like, who's got it? Jesus. And you got to think it. Obviously, it's a public area. Obviously, there's children around because Jesus turns around, he says, and he called a little child and had them stand among them. Now, I've heard this passage preached about kids' ministry within the church, the importance of a child, and our responsibility to children on all levels. I've heard that over and over again. I actually, this morning, simply want to share my heart regarding kids here at Seoul, kids in church. Now, I have personally been, Sharon and I, and a couple of my boys have personally been on the receiving end of a noisy child in the back row of a church in California. Are you tracking with me? We are visitors, right? One of our boys was a little energetic, and we sat at the back of a church that will remain nameless, <coughs> Crystal Cathedral. And um, I always saw it on TV, and now I was able to go and visit it in person, and Sharon and I and, and our boys, we, we went, and, and we sat, and son number, and I'm not sure which one, it doesn't really matter, I'm probably both of them, they were energetic, and that was fine, they were kids, and a miserable usher, in his best disgusted voice, told us, please take your child out. And so as it turns out, one spouse went outside. It was actually me. The other went inside. I had to go outside because I was going to kill the guy. But one spouse went outside and the other stayed inside. And the fact is, both spouses fumed at that point in time. And I had to make a promise to myself to say that this would never happen to anybody else under my ministry. Can I talk to you about the kids here at Seoul? 
I love them. I love their energy. I love their innocence. I love their action. And so if you're sitting there thinking as a parent, Jerry, you don't know my kids. It's so hard getting them to come to church, fighting to put on socks and jackets and mitts and boots. I just don't have the energy, energy, Jerry, Jerry. You just shut up. (laughs) Just shut up. I've been there. We've had four boys under the age of six. I've been there. We've done that. We've pastored a church at the same time. We've led worship, taught a class, preached sermons, and we did it twice on Sundays. Ooh, excuse me. I actually, to be really honest, parents, I don't want to hear you comp- the complaints because you may not want to hear what I have to say today regarding your children. Ooh, them's fighting words. Yeah, here it is. Your kids need church. Your kids need church, and the church needs your kids. Your kids need to be here in the atrium. Your kids need to be here in the worship gathering. They need to be in the nursery. They need to be in soul kids. They need to feel that they can run free. And you hear me say that, be free, run, let them go. They need that. When the gathering's over, they can run back and forth. Just don't get hit by chairs, being that, you know, whatever it is. They need to be present. They need to sense and experience and observe and participate what's going on on any given Sunday. Pick a gathering that's best for their internal clock. Make it work the best for your family. So mom and dad, just hear me out really clearly. You are doing something very, very, very important. And I know it's not easy, and I see you when I watch people walking in with your arms overflowing, and I I know, I know you've already come to church tired. I get that. And parenting is tiring. It's really tiring. And I watch you bounce and sway your kids to, to keep maybe the baby quiet or you're, you're juggling that infant car seat and, and the diaper bag as you're trying to find a chair when you walk in. I see that. I see it when, on your face when you wince if your baby cries or makes noise. I see you anxiously going into your bags to pull things out of your bags and do whatever tricks and magic you do to try to quiet your kids. I see all that. I see you with your toddlers and preschoolers. I watch you cringe when a girl asks an innocent question in a voice that wasn't an inside voice. You tracking with me? I I hear the exasperation in your voice as you beg your child, just sit down. You know, uh, not everyone is looking. You need to know that, but it feels that way sometimes. And I know you're wondering, is it worth it? Why do I bother? What should we do? You know, they have live stream. We can live stream now. I know, I know you often leave the church more exhausted than fulfilled. I get it. But understand, parents, what you are doing is so important. When you are here, the church is filled with joyful noise. It is. When you are here, the body of Christ is more present When you are here, we are reminded that this worship thing we do isn't about Bible study or or personal quiet contemplation, but it's coming together to worship as a community where all are welcome, where we share in the word and we share communion together. And when when you are here, I have hope that these seats in front of me won't be empty in 10 years when your kids are 10 years older. And I know that they're learning and and why we worship. Uh, All this is so important to do it now when they're young before it's too late. They are learning that worship is important. They're learning that we prioritize our coming together, our gathering together, that that's important. And I see them learning. I see them in the midst of their cries and their whines or their giggles, you know, in the midst of, of crinkling fish crackers all over the place and growing piles of crumbs. You know, I see a little girl who insists on going two rows up to share a piece of their cracker or cookie with someone that they've never met or those who love to come walking out through the front of the stage just to check out the pastor to make sure he's preaching, you know, proper theology. 
I hear the little boys quite loudly slurping his cup, his last drop, his every last drop of wine out of the communion cup, determined not to miss a drop of Jesus, only to crunch it when it was all said and done and afterwards. You know, I watch children color excitingly on their table, and they, they'll make a cross, and then they point to the cross at one side of our auditorium. I, I hear, from here, I hear the echoes of the amens with those kids who are just three seconds behind everybody else. I see your children learning. And I know how hard it is and what you're doing. But I want you to know, people, that it matters. It matters to me. It matters to my children not to be alone in the seats. It matters to the congregation who knows that other families care about faith, that faith is first. It matters for them to see young people and youth growing up within the realms of the community. And even on those weeks when you can't see those those little moments, trust me, it matters that they're here. It matters that they learn worship and what we do as a community of faith together, that everybody is welcome. It matters that our kids' worship uh, is important. You know, we, we have to teach our children that their worship matters. We teach them uh, that they are enough right here, right now, that they even function just as members of our church community. They don't need to wait until they can believe and pray or worship a certain way to be welcome here. And I know adults who are still looking to be shown that. And it matters that children learn that they are an integral part of the church community, that their prayers that they write down that gets delivered to us in staff meetings, that their songs, and even their badly or perfectly de- timed, depending on who you ask, those cries or those whines or those joyful noises, because it means that they are present in our midst. I know it's hard, but you need to hear it from me. Thank you. Thank you for what you do when you bring your kids to church. Because please know that, that, that your family, with all its noise, with all its struggle, with all its commotion and joy, you're not simply tolerated. You are a vital part of the community gathered in worship. Yes? Yeah. Yep, yep. Well, you don't know my kids. Yeah, I do know your kids. Listen loud and clear. Children are welcome here at Seoul. Parents and caregivers, you need to relax. God put the wiggle in the child. That's just the way it is. You don't have to suppress it here. We don't expect perfection from your child. You maybe, but not your kid. And that's why we have tables for you. That's why we have toys and crayons on the outside of the auditorium. So kids can not only be preoccupied, but they can also listen to the worship at the same time. They are multitaskers. And I understand they're going to make noise. Man, they're kids. They're kids. And because kids love to draw, I will say this. Parents, I invite you. I challenge you, parents. Parents to encourage your kids to do a drawing and encourage them to give it to me on a Sunday. And here's my my pledge to you. I will start a wall in our office where we will post all the kids' drawings that come to me. Why? Because the way we welcome children shapes their responses to the church, to God, and to one another. And that will carry over into their teen years. And that will carry over into their young adult years. And when we first started Seoul, I'll never forget it. 1111 Chevrolet, we were in the conference center. And there was rumbling going on at one of the tables. Well, it was an outright riot. But regardless, it was going on. And somebody approached me after the gathering and said, you should do something about the noise the kids are making in church. To which I said, you're right. So why don't you come down and sit at the very front because there's room in the first and second row and you won't be distracted by all the noise in the back because we love kids here at Seoul. It's part of who we are. 
And I would also encourage parents to come and have your kids stand in the front. That's funny because there's different band members. Their kids, they come and they stand in the front and they watch their, their parents and they dance with their parents. And it's beautiful. You know, we have a number of little dancers here at Seoul. And if you serve on the first impression team or somewhere else on a Sunday, take them with you. Let them be a part of the community. Let them greet people. Let them be in the parking lot. Watch them very carefully. Have a leash, helmet, things like that. But, you know, make it work. Show them what it means in action to serve God with your time and your talents. Teach them how to serve God with your treasure. You're tracking with me, right? Parents, teach them. Model to them how to give. It will be a lasting impression on them. And if you have to leave the gathering with your child, They've taken a shoe, they found a piece of metal, and they are making music. And you feel that you need to leave the gathering. Please feel free to do so without judgment. It's okay. But please come back. That's the most important thing. If you, if you need to nurse, there's a place in the women's washroom just inside the hallways, uh, just right there uh, by the change room door there, that's made up really nice. It's perfect. It's just for ladies only. Just want to throw that there. Um, and if you're a person who gets offended by a lady publicly breastfeeding, please, and I mean please put a blanket over your head and you'll be okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> Children are a beautiful and often a messy reminder that the church is growing. It's what it is. Now, can I get back to our text? <laughs> Our goal in Bible study is not to determine the personal meaning of a verse. Our goal is to discover what the Holy Spirit meant when he gave us the chapter. And so the disciples are all about who's the greatest. Hey, Jesus, who's the best? Who's the best? You know, I, I, I do that all the time in my hockey team. But that's a whole different story. Jesus puts a child in their midst. He all of a sudden focuses the attention on this little squirrely kid. And he tells them that they got to become like this kid. you got to be kidding me. And the point of the child as an illustration, the point is humility. It's not innocence and it's not faith, it's humility. The child is not concerned with social status. That eventually comes, but, but it doesn't matter whether you're 6 or 60. You only get to heaven one way, and that is by humbling yourself. And all of us are little children of God, and the humility must always be there. We, we enter the family only by humility when you think about it. Babies don't enter the world with boasts, brags, demands, and, you know, you need to meet my... They, they kind of say that, but they're not demanding their rights and what they're going to do. No, they're born dependent upon their parents for everything. Humility. Humility impacts the family. Humility impacts the family. The kingdom cannot be gained by doing good works and, or taking it by force. The disciples are in disunity because they don't have humility. And Jesus says, you need to be like this child. And he reminds them how they got to be a disciple in the first place. It was humility. You know, he went up, he found them, he called them. Humility impacts the fellowship, the family. Disciples have to change. They have to become like their children in their heart attitudes. The same teaching is being applied to us this morning. And the person who truly humbles himself will be the greatest in the kingdom. And the disciples have set aside this rivalry and they had to now begin to humble themselves. Verses 5 to 9, it, um, they form a tight unit built around this, this promise warning proverb. It's held together by what is known by some theologians as a stumbling block theme. And you can read it there on the screens, but the first part of the teaching is a blessing. You know, whoever welcomes a, a little child in the name of Christ welcomes Christ. That, that's a blessing. Jesus was not meaning a little child literally, but one who humbled himself. Now, again, stay with context. One who humbled himself or, or herself to receive Christ by faith. They are the disciples. They're not, they are not welcome because they're great. They are welcome because they are believers in Jesus. And on the other hand, children are also susceptible to danger. And they can stumble, even the best of them, the greatest of them, right? And so the warning's given to those who cause the little ones to stumble. There's a warning that's given when we cause other people to stumble. And because that crime is so great, 
when people not only reject Jesus, but seek to cause the little ones and the believers to sin and to turn away from Christ, there's a very strong denunciation that is there. It'd be better for them to be drowned in the sea before doing it, before committing the crimes and <laughs> ending up in the end times. And so it's interesting because Jesus makes this point that the little ones, the disciples of Jesus, are under his care. And whatever people do to them, they're actually really doing to Jesus. Think about that. Whatever we do in the family to one another, we're actually doing to Jesus. And again, it fits with the imagery of family. Verses 8 and 9, Jesus instructs his disciples to get rid of the things that cause them to sin. I love this passage. For you literalists, some of you are sinning really bad. He challenges his followers to be severe about dealing with their own sins. The language that Jesus is using is extravagant without question. We know that he doesn't mean go and cut off your hand literally. But the point is, is that the disciples could also become aggressors and not just victims. Think about this in the realm of family. Think about that in the realm of church. And Jesus says, but if your hand... In other words, the failure to deal radically with sin in our own life, especially sin that harms other believers, right, is problematic. It's not enough for Christians to confess the sins and then to go on to their normal way. When we begin to understand the scripture, they got to determine, you and I have the onus on ourselves to determine how to rid themselves of the opportunity and the propensity for such sin. How do we deal with this stuff in our life? And Jesus says, take the radical approach and cut it off. He goes on, he begins to describe, again, how a shepherd seeks one after one, one sheep takes off, leaving the 99 on the mountain. So he goes out and he searches for that one that's in danger. And then there's great rejoicing when the lost sinner is reconciled and comes home. And we can summarize the, the, this whole first part of the chapter like this, is that, look at you and I, when we begin to read Matthew 18, we need to deal with our own selfishness and sins. It's a personal obligation, but we also have to seek out those who are straying. This is what it is about family. In our culture, we, we, we have our barriers. We have our invisible lines. And don't you dare step over that invisible line. Don't you dare come into my, my area. And this is not what Jesus is saying here. And then verse 15, Jesus tells his followers what to do when somebody sins against them. And, and it's here I actually want to stop this morning. It's here where I want to actually give you some tools to deal with people. And like I said earlier, it, the context is here for the church. But I actually think that these tools that I will give you is something that you can take out into everyday life when it comes to people and conflict. Listen carefully. If your brother sins against you, go and show him. Go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Let's understand the context of this chapter. He's talking, Jesus is talking to the disciples, he's talking to the family, he's talking to the church, the church is people. So look at, Pete, it's natural that most problems in church are between who? Okay, let me, let, 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 let me help you out. Most problems in church are between people, thank you, very good. Sorry to be so condescending. Most problems in church are between people, right? And this is what we find ourselves. And most problems involving people result in one of these three things. The first one is a miscommunication, right? How many times have you been offended by somebody in a church setting or in, let's say, a work setting? And why is it? It's because miscommunication. The other one is wounded pride. And the other one is spiritual immaturity. I'll say this, that the first one is actually hard to prevent totally. It just happens. The second one is easily dealt with, unless, of course, you're the one with the pride issue. 
The latter is both difficult and simple because it takes time, it takes effort for us to grow spiritually. And so God is patient with us, is he not? And we should be patient then with each other, but we should strive to be growing and strive to be maturing and to grow and mature in Christ. When you think about it, to do that in our faith is a multifaceted task, but a big chunk of it comes in our understanding of servanthood and humility. And this chapter, Matthew 18, is actually a gold mine for this. So what happens in our world today? When we feel that somebody has sinned against us, what do we do? We pull out our keyboard. And we just, just go to town. And we write that email or we send that text because we're so angry. Or we make some social media posts, right? Sometimes you actually call the person out. Sometimes you don't, but you, everybody knows who you're talking about. Why? Because we've been hurt. Why? Because we've been sinned against. And why? We want to we respond, but why? Because, well, I'm justified. Because we've all been hurt, right? We've all been sinned against. And even if the note that you write, the email, the text, the Facebook post, even if it's not scathing, but 99% of the times it usually is, because that's what is known as a static medium, people who are on the other end end up reading that print with their own emotions into it, having no clue to what you're really saying. So they read their own emotions into what you're saying, and many times they come to a conclusion that isn't completely misunderstood or aggravated all the more. A dysfunctional family serves no one well. Christian children suffer, parents grieve, the opportunities to honor God through our family are lost. And the same can be said of the church. If we allow disharmony amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, we too become dysfunctional and we suffer and God grieves and, and opportunities to honor him through, through our family are lost. And so what Jesus does in this passage is he gives us a very simple plan to resolve conflict. Now, if you notice the first step on this path or plan to peace, whatever you want to call it, is actually uh, uh, to, you have to ascertain, first of all, if your brother or sister has actually sinned against you. The first word there says, if. Look at that first part of the verse. If your brother or sister sins against you. This, this is important because sometimes we label something as sin when it actually is simply just a preference or it's a pet peeve or it's a personality trait or just it's a personal irritation that bugs us, but we think we've been sinned against. And so when you find yourself in the conflict with another believer, we need to ask ourselves specifically, what sin is being committed here and where does the Bible address that sin? Are you tracking with me when I'm saying this? We need to be specific. We need to test your answer against the scripture. If it passes, if you found what it's all about, Jesus' model now will guide you. If it doesn't, you're going to have a different problem. And notice the emphasis is now on you. Sometimes we're called to overlook something and, and honestly not even say a word. Some people, they're so sensitive, and they just take every word. You know, sometimes you just need to grow up, overlook stuff. People say stupid stuff. I say stupid stuff. You don't think I articulate my messages so that to provoke a reaction? Oh, now you got me mad because you told me to put a blanket over my head. Yeah, I did. It's stupid. It's not sinful. I'm trying to give you practical application. And this is the, you know, the idea is that sometimes it's good for us to take the petty things that people may say to us or do unintentionally to us, sometimes even intentionally, and put them in a grace box and put it in a hard-to-reach place. You're tracking with me. Sometimes we just need to do that. And in those instances... When we actually do that, then we begin to fulfill Ephesians 4, 2 that says, bear with one another in love. Put up with each other. 
people are going to say things. People are going to do things. People's personality are irritant. Some people's voices, like mine, is like a chalkboard, and as the nails are going down, or like biting on tinfoil, my favorite, right? You, you got it. It's, sometimes you just got to put it in a grace box, put it up high, and move on. And bear with one another in love. And while we bear with some, th- some things and overlook some things, we can, uh, you know, we don't have to put up with sin. Somebody once said this, the church should be a safe place for sinners without being a safe place for sin. I love that. The church needs to be a safe place for sinners but not without being a safe place for sin. But I'm afraid that in our time now, in our culture, the opposite is true. We just let a lot of stuff go. Why? Because we're afraid. We're afraid of talking with people. We're afraid, oh, you're going to judge me. You're gonna... We're afraid of the conversations. And the opposite is true in some cases, in some churches. You know, we can't keep our anger or our animosity inside the box. And it lashes out. So let me just say this. If you're a believer here today, if your brother and sister has sinned against you, if somebody in this community, maybe they're not even part of this church community, but they're part of another church community, if they sinned against you, there are two important imperatives that you need to follow. These are Jesus' commands. Go and show. Look at the next phrase. Go tell him his fault between you and him alone. To go means to continue to go. It means to pursue without being distracted. We're not to wait around until the other person comes to us. The, the word tell it refers to being convincing. You, you, gotta, you, you can't be casual or indifferent or like, act like it's going to go away on its own because it won't. Don't wait for the other person to come to you or you're going to be waiting for a very long time, possibly forever. Working towards reconciliation, when you think about it, when we work towards reconciliation, it's always my responsibility. It's my responsibility. So whether we sin against somebody or not, which is actually Matthew chapter 5 deals with this, or we've been the one who's sinned against, which is Matthew chapter 18, it's always our duty to go. And this is the first step. And, And I like what Jesus says, between you and him alone. So if some brother or some sister has sinned against you, he or she needs to be the first to know. Conflict is not going to be resolved accidentally, but only if we are intentional in that. So if you're dealing with conflict today, and when I talk about stuff like this, some of you are having conversations in your head and names and voices and stuff, but you don't know. Well, I know I don't know, so just listen to what Jesus is teaching, and then take Jesus' word for it, not mine. You know, it's not easy. Never said it was, but it's so important. When we go and we talk with one person, you know what that actually does? It actually avoids shaming the person that you're trying to talk to. When you make it a one-on-one conversation, you avoid the shame. If you go public with your offense without talking to that person about it, you actually bring shame on them, and you start bringing your business and their business to everybody else. It doesn't really matter. The principle that Jesus is saying is, look, keep your circle small. You go and talk to that one person. Also, talking one-on-one, face-to-face with an individual, when you're face-to-face, it minimizes any misunderstandings. They're there. They can read your face. They can hear your voice. They can see the emotion. They can feel your tears. Right? E. And then sometimes you'll discover when you get into a face-to-face conversation that maybe, just maybe, you were mistaken. Or maybe there's a simple misunderstanding that can be cleared up simply by just meeting together. You know, there's a fascinating story, and, and you need to read this. This is, this is found in Joshua chapter 22. Two and a half of the tribes uh, 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 it, in Joshua 10, 22 are on the east side of the Jordan River, and they, they construct this altar. And... Uh, Excuse me. The other tribes go ballistic, and uh, they accuse these two and a half ch- tribes of being. Well, they accuse them of pretty vile things, and eventually they are ready to, to uh, take them to war and to decimate these tribes. These are the children of Israel. 
So when the other tribes sent parties to talk to these two and a half, the two and a half explained that they did what they did. This altar that they set up wasn't a religious altar to worship some false god. They did it as a witness to teach their children. This is to remind our kids of the greatness of God. So here we are, you know, thousands of people just getting involved and almost starting off a war, and the issue is resolved. Why? Because some people go and they talk. They don't presume. And it's interesting that had the Israelites not only misunderstood, they actually, at that point, they not just misunderstood, they judged and they threatened and they planned an, an extermination. And what cleared it all up was a face-to-face meeting. Fascinating little story. So meeting face-to-face keeps you from hating the person. Did you know that? Meeting face-to-face keeps you from hating the person. When you meet face-to-face, uh, the other person may not even know that they have offended you. It's quite possible. And when you meet face-to-face, it limits any gossip. Unfortunately, many of us go to others first, right, when we're hurt and gossip starts. And, you know, when in reality we should be talking to the person privately uh, about what he or she has done to us. And so when I have an issue with somebody, this passage tells me, and here's your life application, when you have an issue with somebody, the passage also tells you that you must go quietly. Ephesians 4, 26, 26, 26. Whatever. Talk about kids, your mind goes wild, you know. (laughs) Ephesians 4.26 says that I must do it quickly. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Matthew 7.5 says to do it carefully. Again, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. What is it all about? It's all about humility. This is the point that Jesus is trying to make. And the biggest reason for telling somebody in private is because this will handle most every situation. Most every situation. Look at this. If your brother listens to you, if if he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But you know what? If we skip that step and start telling others, we actually short circuit the person's restoration. And remember this. The goal in the community should always be restoration. Right? Right? We all need a do-over. We all want that spiritual reset. We all need it. That should be the goal of the church community. How do we work together to restore people? And our aim is always to win our brothers and sisters, not to win the argument. Not to say, you know, drop the mic and walk away. You know, we need to work towards reconciliation. And we need to understand because as people, it's always my responsibility to take the initiative. So what do you do if you have a private conversation and the person who sinned against you doesn't listen when you go and show? What do you do? Well, according to Jesus, it's time to increase the pressure. I like this one. And how do you increase the pressure? Well, you start getting other people involved. If he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidences of two or three witnesses. This is actually a quote from Deuteronomy 9.15. See, in the Old Testament, a person couldn't be convicted on the word of just one witnesses. You needed other witnesses to be involved in the process. Why? Because now this is about protection. So that nobody could be slanderous, nobody could create lies or do whatever else. Um, The information had to be confirmed. And here are some other benefits when we have to confront people um, uh, with having a witness or in some cases two. The fact is, is that they can actually establish facts. It's a way of them saying this is not being made up by anybody. No, this is what we see. This is what we've heard. This is what we've felt. You know, they can affirm that a sin has taken place. They can observe the erring brother or sister's reaction. That They were there. We saw it. We heard what they said. They they have others involved. They may communicate the gravity of the situation, reinforce that need for, hey, look, some repentance needs to take place here. They can also keep things from escalating. And witnesses can remember and record what's being said. But once again, the objective is restoration. It's restoration. 
You come in there kind. You come in there with humility. The first conversation didn't work. Hey, I'd like to meet with you again. Is that all right? Can we sit down again? And you bring one, usually two. I prefer to bring one. So when you start getting more and more people, it starts getting a little bit more messy. But it's human nature. And you talk about it. And again, you know, uh, if your sibling, if spiritual sibling, if I could put it that way, repents, then you restore them. You stop the process. You don't tell others about it. If he or she doesn't, then according to Jesus' teaching, there's actually a third place to move on to. And again, the passage moves from a singular involvement to a plural engagement, and more so the further you go in the process. The third step says that we need to make a public announcement to the church. Oh, this is my favorite. Because Jesus said, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. This is a sorrowful, sober, serious moment. And if anything has to get this far, it shouldn't be rushed into. This is a step when there is continued, confirmed, unconfessed sin in one person's life that is affecting the community. We're not to go and go on a witch hunt and we're not the sin police for Pete's sake. You know, but as members of a community, a Christian community, membership has its privileges and, and its responsibilities. And this level, like the first two, is meant to be loving. It's not meant to be heavy-fisted. It's meant to be loving, Um, although when we first read it, it doesn't seem like that. And again, when you think about it, Jesus' goal is all about uh, reconciliation, and it starts with humility. The congregation's role at this step is for a plead and and to pray that the person changes their heart. And, And this is what we call church discipline. Now, here's the problem, especially, and I I remember this clearly, and some of you have probably grown up where people were hauled up in front of the church and made to apologize, right? In church discipline scenarios. Well, unfortunately, I think the misunderstanding of this passage of Scripture is that people have rushed straight to point three and forgot about point one and two, causing serious damage to individuals who are pulled up on stage. And in essence, publicly humiliated. I think if we're going to start talking about this stage, what Jesus is referring to, we need to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. Which actually captures the heart behind what is called church discipline. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with them, that he may be ashamed. And don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Interesting outline there. The idea is that exclusion should make the believer repentant. Again, if there's conversation going on, it's not like you're giving a person a cold shoulder. They understand what's going on. But we should also be waiting with open arms. Loving them as, as, if I could put it this way, as outsiders willing to be won back over. And again, if we study Jesus, who does he love? He loves the pagans. He loves the tax collectors. But he was also very straight and very direct with them. And so we have to try to make the distinction between restorative discipline and vindictive discipline. Because discipline carries with it the goal of teaching, of training, whereas punishment is often just an end of itself. You do wrong, you get punished. Discipline is a whole different story. Hebrews says, for the moment of all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. There is something positive when there is discipline in our lives. And so if you're like me, this process actually is very intimidating. I feel that way. But knowing this, Jesus gives us two promises when we take the step to obey him. The first promise is, is that of his power. When you and I begin to pursue biblical peacemaking by following these steps that he outlines, verses 18 and 19 tell us that what is done here 
is to be declared also in heaven. And he says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again I say to you, if two of you agree on the activity of earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. This passage of scripture, and that is so used out of context in so many different ways, I can't even go about right now. This passage of scripture is about church discipline. It's about trying to restore people who have strayed outside the family. Heaven itself endorses the activity of the church when discipline is done in the right way. When our confrontation with one another is done in a right way. Secondly, there's the promise of his presence. And it's taken a while for us to set the context, but now we come to this text found in, in verse 20. For two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. How many times do we hear that? Oh, there's nobody in church today. Well, the Bible says where two or three are gathered, you know, God's here. Yeah, that's not what it's talking about. Context determines the meaning of the scriptures. And we need to see this. We're two or three. Who are the two or three? Notice that. Who are the two or three? Those are the witnesses. The witnesses in verse 16, verse 19. This sounds like a nice promise for a small prayer meeting or nobody at a worship service. But it actually breaks down at that point. That's not what it's about. If God was only with us when two or three gathered, does that not mean he's not present when I pray alone? Like, I, I, I don't get. Also, this text says two or three, not two or more. Does that mean that God is not with us when we have four or more? Well, of course not. God is omnipresent. And so we have to remember the context of the verses is church discipline. It's relational correction. But there's one thing we have to do, and I actually think it's probably the hardest of all. When somebody sins against us, we're to forgive. And right after this passage, we see that we have to be willing to forgive 70 times 7 when somebody sins against us. It now begins to When it comes to relational conflict, it gives us a whole new perspective of what we're doing here. C.S. Lewis once said, he said this, everybody says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. I I just love how he did that. You know, we are called to forgive the faults of fellow believers. And the only way we can do that is to remember exactly how much you and I have been forgiven. There are two Greek words for forgiveness. One refers to the debts that have been paid in full or canceled in full. The other means to bestow favor freely or unconditionally. And we're to go so that we can let go. We're to love so that we can leave the hurts. And and working towards reconciliation. Remember, people, it's always my responsibility. And this is exactly what God has done for us. And this is what he calls us, the church, to do for others. And it's the way of being a peacemaker. And when we do what we're called to do, we have the promise of his power. We have the promise of his presence. So I'm writing my sermon. And then one thought comes, because you, you can't preach a sermon unless you can preach it to yourself. And so the one question comes is, so is there anybody you need to have a conversation with? Is there anybody you need to have a conversation with? And then were you actually sinned against or was it something much less? And I believe that what Jesus shares here hits us all deep at the center of our hearts. So how's your attitude? Go ahead, if you want to just start playing. How's your attitude? You know, before you go to a brother or sister, make sure you're not going with any spiritual superiority, but please go with humility. Because we're to come alongside, we're not to come over and above. I love what Galatians says. It says, brothers, if anybody is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anybody thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. And maybe you're here today and you're like, Jerry, I don't even know if I can do this. 
maybe you're here today and you got a bunch of questions about God. Maybe you're here today, you, you know, you're talking to the church and I want to know about Jesus and, and stuff like that. Or maybe you're here and you hurt somebody and maybe you actually use this passage of scripture in the wrong way against them or maybe it has been used in the wrong way against you. Maybe you just need a, a spiritual reset. Take out your phone. You have my permission? Some of you are still probably playing games, but that's okay. It's Roman Prashaga's birthday today. And Cameron Gray checked in at Soul Sanctuary. Awesome. You take out your phone, and what I ask is, if you are needing prayer, if you are needing a conversation with any one of us here at staff, just text the word soul to the number on the screen. We're going to contact you personally. And it doesn't matter when you text us. I realized that last week after we did this, somebody texted very early the following morning. Because God just does stuff in our lives. He speaks to us. And sometimes it just actually takes courage to do this. We'll contact you personally. We want to pray with you. We want to ask you questions. We're not going to be creepily stalking you or anything like that. We just actually just simply care about your spiritual well-being. And so I just want to say to you that somebody will respond to you personally. This is the type of God we serve. He wants us to deal with each other personally. And he's going to show up where you're at. Because that's who he is and that's what he does. So... While I pray, and if you need to reach out, feel free to text soul. And the rest of us, let's just pray. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes with me, and I, yeah, amen. And as I pray, if you need follow-up, text soul and the number on the screen. Dear God, sometimes we actually feel afraid. So give us your spirit of power. And sometimes we feel upset. And so we need your spirit of love. And sometimes we feel confused when we're dealing with other people, but give us your spirit of self-control. And thank you for sending the Holy Spirit to live in us. Your goodness, your generosity, and giving all of us we need, we, we recognize that and help us to praise you, O oh God, for that. In every circumstance of life, whether it's in good times or bad, help us to trust you in love and faithfulness with all that we have and all that we are. God, just help us to serve you. And as we speak or write or listen to those nearby or far away, help us simply to share your love and our plans and work for ourselves and for other people. God, help us to glorify others and every, or help us to glorify you and, and every thought and word and deed by the power of your Holy Spirit this week. May we live for you and may we as children of God walk humbly before you and do our best to restore others in our relationship that we have. Why don't you stand with me? Just before that, I give you the blessing, if uh, you are able-bodied and can help us, if you can stack the last three rows of chairs eight high, we like to make it a little bit more comfortable for the second gathering. In ancient time, the one who blessed extended his hands for his blessing. Those receiving the blessing did likewise. I ended at 1041. Give me a amen. I am working so hard for this, people. Here it is. Go freely from here as your true selves and as witnesses of what you have seen and heard. Share God's love with all that you meet and bring hope to all those who are in despair. Live lives of gratitude and praise and may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ and the ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit be within you, among you, until we meet again next week. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and live the church. And we'll see